Hi, welcome to My Third Life, where we're going to talk today about soloing in general. And on my mind is I have to solo tomorrow on a CD. I'm recording three of my original songs. This has been a pet project of mine for a long time. I decided to pull the trigger and do it. Uh, the truth of the matter is you really never feel ready. All a, all a recording does is give you a snapshot of who you are at this specific time in your career and this specific day. So there's some days you could feel wonderful, some days you feel terrible, some days something's on your mind. So there's many different variables when you're recording. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not a cut and dry process. But I've been thinking about it in terms of what I've seen online about soloing. And it's funny, there's there's two camps. There's one camp, or there's many more, but there's two big ones. There's one camp that says, uh, you can solo in three weeks and let me teach you the secret and you too can be a star. Just follow my program. Then there's another camp that says, well, there, you need 40,000 hours and you need to study 16 years to college and here's all my programs and subscribe to everything I have and maybe you'll solo in 20 years, whatever. But I was thinking about it today and I've got a, a guy that I'm, I'm teaching sax and we're talking about soloing. And the more I think about it, so a good solo is kind of like prepping for a date. Okay, so you're going out on a date. First of all, before you show up, you do as much work as you can. You're checking your appearance. You're checking the car. You're making sure if you have tickets to go somewhere, you have the tickets. So you're trying to get rid of anything out of, out of the ordinary that may occur that may be a problem on your date. Then when you show up on the date, as you're driving up, you're probably thinking along the lines of what am I going to talk about? How am I going to start conversations? And that is that, that's exactly the same thing you're doing as you're soloing. Um, when I think about good solos that I've heard recorded, typically they come in with a fairly strong statement, something interesting that is engaging, that pulls me into the solo. And so I want to hear what happens next then just like a date, you're having a back and forth conversation where you're saying, okay, uh, what do you think about Tuesdays? Well, I love Tuesdays. Well, what about if we go here and do this? Oh, that sounds great. But you're developing a dialogue with each other. Also, as time goes on, this dialogue needs to change and perhaps get a little more intense because you don't want to lose the interest. You don't want to lose the intensity. And that's the same thing with a solo. As your solo goes on, typically it builds up with a little bit of a statement, then you do the back and forth. And then as you go along, you know, it, it builds up to some kind of a climax and then fades back down. But most good solos follow the same thing as a composition where you start here, go up to here, then you come back down to here, typically. That, that, that's, that's what I've learned through many, many years of watching these things. But I don't think you need 70,000 years to do this. I, I was thinking about it. What are shortcuts that might be helpful? One is uh, if we know ahead of time that a good opening statement's cool, why not make up five good opening statements? So what's a good opening statement? Well, you take the chord progression you're going to solo on and say, what's a good way to start this conversation? And there's nothing wrong with thinking these things out in advance. Uh, just because you think about what you might say in a date doesn't mean you're going to say it the, the exact way you think about it. And just because you thought ahead of everything that might happen, there might be a curve thrown at you. So, but there's still nothing wrong with getting your own mind settled and saying to yourself, okay, this is how I want to start it. So I think maybe five good openings is a good idea. So what's a good opening? So you take a minor chord, and if you like, if you like the minor chord, um, it could be a da, da, da. Sanborn's used that for 40 years. I mean, that's part of what he plays, and that's a good opening statement. Or with the same chord, you might start in the root. Bop, ba, da, 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 da. Now, this doesn't have to be rocket science. You don't have to amaze the world with your first statement. The idea is simply to say, knock, 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 here I am. And that's the idea of soloing. So you make your first statement. And the biggest problem that I have and a lot of improvisers have is 
you start having your sentences sound like it's one run on sentence and you never stop talking and it goes on and on and on. And then, then we do this and then we do that. And then we talk about this and then we go here, then we go there. And like a good conversation, there have to be breaks where you've made a thought and there's time to think about it before you respond. And also if you don't, uh, if you don't, if you don't have some kind of connection with what's happening next, and that requires some space, the soul is not going to make any sense. So you do your first opening statement, then you think to yourself, and this is what happens in real time, but it happens very quick. So your mind starts going, how about ba da da ba da da, and then what might answer that? Ba da ba 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 da da ba da. Now I'm doing everything on a minor pentatonic, which is what I'm hearing now but I might do something differently. See, I wouldn't have five of the same kinds. There, you have, there's so many choices. But what I'm saying is you don't have to go into this thing with 10,000 ideas on what to do. You can narrow it down to four or five things you want to start with. Now, the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to say to myself, make small little ideas that make sense and leave a space. Find some deliberate way to break off and then answer what I've just done or else I get the run on sentence. So that'll be my biggest challenge because when I record tomorrow, I'll be all jacked up. I'll be all excited. I can't wait to go. And yet, just like your first date, you can't show up and be motor mouth for, for 45 minutes or you don't have the second date. Anyway, I think, I think this analogy is, is true. And then you want to start getting a dialogue. So if I say... It's nice outside. Your date doesn't say, yeah, and on Tuesday, I turn into a balloon. You know, the ideas have to somehow match back and forth. So that takes some practice. And there's a lot of things you can do as an improviser. You can run through a set of chord changes, do an idea, take a little bit of time, and then go on to the next idea and see what you think. We, we were just joined by my dog, Leah. <laughs> anyway, but you can go on and, and relate to the first idea. How does this idea work with the idea? Does it complement the idea? Does it answer the idea? And, and I realize I'm not, I'm not talking specifically about the chord and the, the, the chord tone and the chord scale and what have you. I'm talking more structurally, intellectually, how are you going to set up your solo? Because just like the dating analogy, when you come into this, you should know what all the chord changes are. You should have that memorized. You should have a pretty good grasp of your instrument, your chord scales, and your chord tones. Now, nobody's a thousand percent. No, nobody comes in knowing everything about every possible thing about your instrument and, and the music. You just do the best you can. Once again, this recording is a snapshot who you are, just like these vlogs are. I can't do a vlog of what I'm going to be like in five years. I have to do a vlog of what am I right now? What is my focus? What am I trying to do? So I'm excited about it tomorrow. And let me see. And then typically, and this this goes, this goes is true for dates, it's true for solos, and it's true for pieces of music. You typically remember the beginning and you remember the end. And the rest is blah, 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 blah. I mean, usually there, there's usually some spikes in there, but those are the two most memorable parts of this type of a conversation. So you have your strong beginning. Now, what you want to do is make sure you have some kind of an end that makes sense. I hear a lot of guys play, play, play. Then when they stop, you think to yourself, well, I guess they're done, you know, and, and this is a subjective thing, of course, but for me, I like to watch the solo kind of trail off into something logically saying, okay, I'm done. Here's the next soloist or here's the next piece of music that's going to come up. So for me, I like trailing off so you actually know the solo is over rather than scratching your head while he's playing a minute ago. Now he's not playing. So that's something to think about. How do you want to trail your solo down? I've played solos on songs for 10, 15 years, and I don't structure out exactly what I'm going to play, but I know where the emotional peak of that solo is going to be. And I know where it has to end. And then I either hand it off to the next soloist or to the vocalist or whatever's going to happen. But I do have that mapped out in my head. So I hope these ideas are helpful for you guys when you're structuring your own solos. And you don't have to, like I said, you don't have to 
to have a master's degree and, and be the best improviser and the best instrumentalist ever, you can have fun soloing at any level. But these are some structural ideas that'll make sense. Give yourself a strong intro, practice giving ideas that make sense with each other. How do you do that? You vamp between small, just like classically, the classical approach is you don't play the whole darn piece. You take two bars, you get that together, then you add the next two bars and the next two bars. Same thing with this chord progression thing. You practice going between the chords in small segments, then you're able to make a longer line go and it's easier because you've practiced. See, when you're improvising, you're playing two things. You're playing what's on this chord or the approach to that chord. Then you're going to practice and work on getting to the next chord. Those are two separate skills. I mean, they're, they're, you're doing the same thing, but you're doing it a different way. So those are two separate practices that I separate. But I, I hope this is helpful for you guys that don't want to solo. I, as you, I get iReal Pro or get Pandora and just play along and pay attention. It really, it's really a good idea. Uh, I have some students listen to a recording. If, they, if there's five people in the band, five times. So the first time through, what did the drummer do the entire song? And when you really pay attention, you might be amazed. You may, you may hear things. I had no idea he was doing that. Listen to what the bass drum is doing. Then go all the way through and listen to what the bass player is doing on the song. Is he active? Is he, is he, is he not as active? Is he losing space? What, what beat is he emphasizing? Is he ahead of the beat, behind the beat? Then go back and listen to the piano player, the guitar. What harmonies are they putting on there? What extensions? You know, it's amazing what you can listen if you if you if you separate each little individual thing, then go back to the soloist. What did this soloist do? What did this how did this soloist start their solo? How did this soloist build their solo over the period of time? How did the soloist end the solo? Did the soloist refer back to the song itself or something a previous soloist did? See, ideally, this is one long piece of music, and the solo is just a little piece of the piece of music. It's not the whole thing. I mean, yes, a lot of times uh, the improvised music is more important than the head, but ideal if you're playing in a group, you want to present a piece of music together that shows you guys are playing together as a group and responding to each other. And that's another thing. I I'm deliberately leaving space for surprises. So tomorrow when we record, I don't expect things to sound exactly like the, the rehearsals we've had or the test recording we did yesterday. I'm expecting to react to something differently, and that's the magic. In fact, they wanted me to record all the backgrounds and then lay on my solo and my, my instrumental hits on top of it. And I go, no, I want to play it like a jazz concert where I'm playing with the people and recording, and if I have little issues, I'll fix them. But oftentimes, your first take, and this, boy, this goes back to many, many experiences. Oftentimes, your first or second take is fantastic. And then you take two, and it's not as good. And three, and you get tired. And then four, you're getting mentally stressed. And five, sometimes it takes 10 takes to get back to that first take. So that's why you want to capture the magic the first time through as much as you can and see if it's usable on the final recording. You know, at the end of the day, like I said, this is not this is a snapshot. I'm going to do more recordings. Um, I really enjoy this process. There's no faster way, in my opinion, to improve your playing than to record yourself and listen back as a listener and say, whoa, I didn't know I was doing that. And that's out of tune and tone's not good there. And why did I rush that passage? And there's a, a myriad of possible problems when you're playing. Anyway, I wish you guys the best. I wish me the best. <laughs> I know I'll be nervous tomorrow, so I'm going to have to do some exercise beforehand and kind of tamp the energy down. And, and I'm going to sit down and be comfortable. And, and it's, it's a four-hour grind, so it's not, a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. But I'm excited, and I hope this was helpful to you guys. Uh, put some ideas in the comments if you have. I didn't go into the nitty-gritty specifics of a lot of these things because unless you unless I know your playing situation I can't I can't make those kind of suggestions the most important question you ever have to answer is 
what am I trying to produce? What am I trying to do? What kind of a solo am I trying to play? What kind of piece of music do I want to play with? Those are those are the most important questions to answer before anybody can give you advice. Because I think uh, there was a great alto saxophone player, uh, Steve, not Steve Cole, Steve Coleman, I think. He played with Dave Holland. But he said, I don't give people advice because I can't tell them what they should do until I know what they're trying to do. And that's a good point. That's a great point. I, I heard a band last week and I, I just tore my hair out going, gosh, I can't stand this kind of music. But then again, maybe they don't care and maybe it's not important to them. You know, that maybe they're doing what they do and their fans like them and that's all fine. So it'd be pointless for me to start, you know, in my head, okay, they should do this. They should do this. No, you should figure out what they want to do and then go from there. All right. See you guys soon. And I hope this is helpful. Be well. Take care.